This morning's scripture is from Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome again to King's Cross Church. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Trevor. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning and to have the opportunity to preach this word this morning. We'll be in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you've found that or if you're turning there, we'll begin reading here momentarily. And if you've been tracking with us on Sundays, if you've been with us in this series through Romans... <clears throat> and you were here today and you were hoping that this morning's text was going to be a little more hopeful than last week's. Uh, hang in there. Last week we dealt with the human condition and our inclination to replace our creator with his creation. To exchange God's truth for a lie. <clears throat> Verse 20, chapter 1 says. We talked about how doing that has resulted in all kinds of wickedness and sinful behavior that goes against God's plan for human flourishing. And that was described in the latter half of chapter 1. And when we find ourselves in difficult passages, our goal is not to stay in the weeds, uh, so to speak, but it's to glean the truth and the implications that we find there, knowing what we know about the good news of Jesus Christ. So even when the text is hard, our goal is to find the gospel implications. And, and to be honest... Paul is really building a case for bad news before he gets to the good news in Romans. You've probably heard the famous quote by the theologian Thomas Fuller, it's always darkest before the dawn. And with the gospel, it can really do us well to, to spend some time ruminating on the darkness, on the bad news. The light of Christ, the, the good news of Jesus, isn't quite so sweet if you don't have an appreciation for how bad the bad news is. And so our text today, it's not the answer to Romans chapter 1, to the second half of Romans chapter 1. It's, it's a continuation of it with a similar aim. It has a different audience in mind. Uh, but knowing that, I, I urge you to bear with me this morning because I believe that what Paul is saying in today's text should give us pause. It should drive us to self-reflection and for some, deep repentance. Before we jump into the text, though, would you, would you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> God, I'm thankful to be here this morning. Thank you that we, um, in, in our gathering, in our, in our song, in our singing, that we've already uh, talked about the beauty and the richness and the fullness of your love and your great mercy and kindness for us, your loving kindness. God, that you poured out that love and mercy on the cross for us through the work of Jesus Christ. God, we've already sang that. We've already rehearsed that this morning. So with that fresh in our minds and in our hearts, God, would you be with us? Would you hold our hand as we wade into deep waters, as we walk into difficult passages? God, we know that, that your word is true. God, we know that everything you have here is, is for our instruction and our correction and to lead us into the kindness and goodness of your grace. So would you do that for us this morning? <clears throat> would you open our hearts, open our minds, help us to see ourselves in the text where, where we should, but not to do that where we shouldn't? God, would you help us to have a better understanding uh, for 
who we are, who you are, and how you've made us, and how you long for us to follow you. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So in my study, I came across this mock letter being written to Paul uh, from someone who just read chap- Romans chapter 1. So if you were to just read chapter 1 without knowing what was coming in, coming in chapter 2, you, you might be inclined to feel the same way as this fictional letter writer did. And it went something like this. Dear Paul, I have just read the second half of Romans chapter 1. I congratulate you on a vigorous, refreshing expose of evil. I agree with you that it is disgusting when people not only behave badly, but actually approve of bad behavior. It did me good to read your chapter. You will be glad to know that I, for one, do not for a moment approve of those who practice these terrible things, like in verse 32. On the contrary, I recognize them for the evils they are and agree that such people are without excuse. I look forward to chapter 2. Yours sincerely, and maybe we could sign off on that. But Paul anticipated that kind of attitude. At the time of writing this book, of this, of this letter, Paul had been preaching and teaching the gospel for over 20 years. So he, he had learned how different people would react to his teaching, and he knew what was coming. If you've ever watched the Olympics and you tuned in for the fencing, uh, you might have seen the different ways that those athletes will counter each other. They, they counter each other's attacks, and a repost is an offensive thrust that's made by the fencer who's just parried an attack. So they parry an attack, and they have an opening, and they make a thrust. And so Paul has he's anticipated his reader's attack, so to speak, of the Gentile pagan that he just talked about in chapter 1. So now Paul has deflected, and he's redirecting that back at them. And you'll notice that when Paul was describing people committing those sinful acts and exchanging God's truth for a lie in the previous chapter, he continuously referred to those people as they. It's an impersonal pronoun. Those people, them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They committed those sinful acts. And now in chapter 2, verse 1, his language changes. It becomes more personal. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges. So if he he anticipated this response, uh, he anticipated this attitude based on what he just said, who does he have in mind here? Who's he speaking to? Who is the you here? That's the question we want to get down to. And the primary answer to that question is that Paul has the Jewish listener squarely in his sights. Most scholars and commentators agree that this is the case. Uh, there's, there's some debate over whether or not the Jewish listener comes into view until verse 17 when Paul explicitly names it. Uh, but there's sufficient evidence in the text to point to the fact that Paul has turned his attention to this person. There is a prevailing view throughout this time reflected in Jewish writings that God would save and forgive the Jewish people no matter what. They held this belief uh, that Abraham stood at the gates of hell and, and kept Jewish people out, like, like a hockey goalie, uh, regardless of what kind of life they lived. And, and so when, when Paul read, when, when they read chapter 1 of Paul's letter, the Jews would have been nodding along in agreement as Paul lambasted the Gentiles, believing that the wickedness of the Gentiles was what condemned them. And, and being God's chosen people, uh, not, not a lack of sin or behavior or attitudes of the heart, but just being God's chosen people is what justified the Jew before God. So this is the prevailing thought that he's coming up against. So with that knowledge, knowing that this is who who Paul was primarily speaking to, it it could be easy for us, modern-day Christians, not ethnic Jews, to kind of check out, right? Ah, well, well, that's not for me. He's talking to somebody else. But I think that would be hasty. Because if you get down to the foundation of it, beyond someone with a specific Jewish worldview, Paul is talking about someone who has a tendency to cast judgment on other people, has a moral code that they live by and then expects others to live up to that same code, and then feels that keeping in line with this morality gives them some kind of exemption to upholding the standards of God. So when we put it like that, Paul could be talking to any of us or or anyone who thinks they have exclusive rights to the moral high ground. 
Paul just finished saying that the irreligious, the immoral, and the godless are without excuse. Now he turns around to the moral, to the God-fearing, to the religious, and he says the same thing. All of us is without excuse. In the 70s, there was a pop psychology book that came out, and it was called, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. And Paul says, no, I'm not okay, you're not okay, none of us is okay. And that's a point he will later bring completely home in chapter 3 of Romans when he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3, 23. Self-righteous, moral, and religious people are also without excuse. Because your morality and your good deeds and your religion can't save you. And it's not enough. Let's look at the text again. Verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Paul says that when we subscribe to a moral code or a system of religion like the Jewish people and their obsession with keeping the law, and then we try to take that and then judge other people by it, in doing so we condemn ourselves. And this is true no matter what you try to hold up as your standard for morality. You want to judge people by the Ten Commandments? Okay. Have you actually kept all of them? Well, I haven't murdered anybody. Okay. Have you always perfectly honored your parents? Have you never wanted something that wasn't yours? Have you ever lied? You go, okay, well, well the Ten Commandments, that's kind of outdated. I, I prefer the Sermon on the Mount and, and Jesus' teachings on, about love and, and his ideas of, of morality. So maybe you prefer that, but Jesus did teach love, but he also held people to a higher standard. In the concept of murder, adultery, divorce, and more, Jesus actually raised the stakes. All of us will likely get to the end of the day and be able to say, well, I didn't kill anyone. But what about being angry with someone? In Matthew 5, 21, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice against him shall be guilty before the court. Or maybe, maybe you just want to take Jesus' summary of all the law and the prophets. Say, I, I just want to live by the golden rule. I think if we can just live by the golden rule, we'll, we'll be good. So whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets, Matthew 7, 12 says. But who among us can say, we've always perfectly lived that out? I've always treated everyone exactly how I would want to be treated. I've never treated someone unfairly. When we, when we hold up these standards by which we, we say, this is my standard for morality, this is how I, I, I judge other people, we, we can't measure up ourselves. We, we can't stand up perfectly in light of that. It, it's really the heart of the issue because as human beings, we have this, this tendency to judge other people by one standard to expect them to behave in a certain way, and when they don't meet that standard or behave that way, we, we judge harshly. And when we ourselves do the very same things, even when we realize we're doing them, we, we tend to give ourselves a lot of grace. We don't judge ourselves by the same standards we hold other people to. If, if we're really honest, that's usually the case. That's why I think Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck of sawdust that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the plank that is in your own? Or, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a, a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus understood this tendency that we have, and he spoke against it. If any of us is to be judged by the same standard that we judge others, we will not measure up. We are quick to see the flaws in others while ignoring our own. Al Capone, one of the most 
notorious mobsters in American history, a hardened killer and criminal, he said this of himself. I have spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. If this man, someone who most would look at and say, was objectively a terrible person, if he thinks this highly of himself, how much more likely are those who are respectable and who do good things to think more highly of themselves than they ought? Self-righteousness blinds people to their own faults. Look at King David when he was confronted by Nathan with his sin after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then sent her husband Uriah to die on the front lines of the battle. This is 2 Samuel chapter 12. And then Nathan comes to David and he tells him a story and he says this. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his food and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a child to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity." And Nathan said to David, you are the man. He was blind to his own faults, but ready to cast judgment for a less, much less egregious sin. And so you, you might say, okay, yeah, it's hard to live up objectively to any moral standard 100% of the time. We, we're inconsistent in that way. But, but Paul's saying you do the same things. And, and there's some pretty bad things on that list that I haven't done. Okay, good point. Uh, but, but Paul's point here isn't necessarily that we have committed the exact same physical sinful acts he just listed. Although if we go back and look at that list, prob probably some of them do apply. We know the Jewish audience would have, would have balked at that. They would have said, yeah, I, I don't do any of those things. Keeping the law wasn't their issue. The point is that none of us can escape God's judgment. You may not have committed any of the sins listed at the end of Romans 1, but none of us is sinless. When the Pharisees brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus and wanted to stone her according to the law, what, what did Jesus say? He said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. We are truly hypocrites when we condemn others for what we ourselves are doing and that is sin, sinning. Aside from the Jewish audience here, we, we might fall into a couple of categories. One, we might call the moral judge. Someone who, says, who, who doesn't commit sins like those people and believes themselves to be in good standing with God because of their own standard of moral judgment. They tend to judge other people by this standard, but give themselves leeway and grace since they don't commit the big sins. This person loves the moral high ground that their standards give them, and they spend a lot of time, at least privately, if not publicly, shaming and condemning others for their immoral behavior. So that's one category. Another one we might call the sliding scale moralist. This person thinks they're basically good, and as long as they don't commit any big sins like murder or rape or anything like that, that they're okay. This kind of thinking suggests that since we're human, we're under moral obligation to sin. It's just, it's part of who I am. It's human nature. It's just going to happen. We've got to avoid the big ones, but I mean, it's just who I am. And that God is under moral obligation to forgive us. As long as we have a balance, right? Like, I can balance out the bad with the good. It's a sliding scale. I'm better than the people who are doing the bad and the really bad things. This person doesn't understand the holiness of God, or the depth of their own sin. I think a lot of people, uh, both outside the church and unfortunately in the church, think this way. I'm basically a good person. I don't commit any egregious sins. And my life has turned out okay. In other words, like, no higher power has judged me. 
or held me to any type of standard so far. So what need do I really have for God? Paul is saying, look, everyone is without excuse. He's saying the absence of morality is not what condemns you. The absence of morality is not what condemns you. You have need for God because being a good person isn't enough to escape God's judgment. The thing that condemns everyone, both moral and immoral people alike, pagans and pious people, religious and irreligious people, the thing that condemns us all the same is our sin. We have this indwelling sin that causes us to sin and it condemns us regardless of our external appearances of moral behavior. Apart from a miraculous act of God, a sinful person cannot come into contact with a holy and perfect and just God without being judged and condemned on account of their sin. And this is not something that happens like later in our lives, by the way. We, we came into this world with this sin nature. Paul emphasizes this later in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. David, in Psalm 51, 5, understanding his condition, said this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We know this is true. We know this is true. But the problem is no one, especially people who think they're doing things right based on moral standards, no one wants to believe that they have evil in their hearts. But the reality is that all are without excuse. All stand condemned in their sin. And we know this to be true as well because God's judgment does not show any partiality. Look at the next verses, 2 and 3. Now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? We can't escape God's perfect judgment. There, there are no loopholes. Paul moves from our judgment to God's judgment here. And God's judgment as compared to ours it is based on truth. Our judgments rarely are. God's judgment is perfect. It's impartial. It's based only on truth. It, it's not like a human courtroom where sometimes the pursuit of justice can be lost amidst the showy clash of, of brilliant oration by two heavyweight champs of attorneys, right? Like sometimes it becomes about the battle and, and, and who can outfight the other, not about the justice. The idea of justice is lost. His judgment God's judgment will always be based on objective truth. My judgment is often clouded by so many different things. How I'm feeling, like just in general, or how I'm feeling towards whoever it is I'm judging, or whatever it is I'm judging. I, I'm quick to judge the person speeding past me in their car. What is that guy doing? But when I'm going five or 10 miles over the limit, it's okay because I'm in control. I'm going with the flow of traffic. It's easy. Most of the time, my judgment is based on where I feel I am relative to what I am judging. Where I feel I am relative to what I'm judging. In other words, I'm using my own heart. I'm using my own understanding to make judgments, usually in ways that are favorable for me. And as Paul has already reminded us, using our own insight or heart or understanding or morality as the standard for judgment condemns us. We point one finger straight at someone and we have four pointed right back at us. And this is not the case for God. His ways are perfect. His judgments are always true, perfectly just, and perfectly righteous. Righteous. 
Now, before we go further, I, I do want to point something out. Someone might come to this text and conclude, well, may, maybe we shouldn't even use anything as a standard for judgment. We shouldn't even use God's word if that's the case. When it, when it comes to determining like what my friends, my family, my neighbors are doing, like what society is doing, am I, am I supposed to just ignore things that the Bible clearly calls sin or evil or worthy of judgment? There's things that the Bible says are worthy of judgment. Do I turn a blind eye to those things at the end of chapter 1? Because who am I to judge? Because I have no right to judge. So we want to point this out. The words judge and judgment are used a lot through this text. I think it's important for us to understand the language being used here. Paul is using a lot of legal language here. The kind you would find in a courtroom. Judgment is meant to invoke the idea of handing down a verdict to someone. It's not the idea of just making a call between good and bad, or discerning between right and wrong, or forming an opinion or an estimation of something. That's not what he's saying. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible, usually by people who want to continue living in a certain way, that is opposed to God's word, is what? We've already said it this morning. Judge not, judge not that you not be judged. Or the most, it's usually the KJV that gets quoted. Judge not lest you be judged. Probably heard that a lot. And I think this is so often misquoted because people take that to mean, see, you're, you're not allowed to make a determination that, that what I'm doing is right or wrong. And that's not what the language is here. Jesus is actually using in, in, the, in, the, old, in the New Testament Greek the word for judge there is the same. It's the same as the, the words here in this passage. The Bible does call us to rightly judge between right and wrong. If we look at the sins of the unbeliever and think, ah, well, I, you know, I can't judge that. Well, who am I to judge, you know? I think we've missed the point. We're not called to turn a blind eye to things that the Bible calls sin. And in doing that, we actually, in the other sense, we condemn ourselves along with those mentioned in verse 32 of chapter 1, the people who give approval to those who practice them. The attitude of our heart is what matters here. The attitude of our heart. Do I look at those people who are living in sin and do I condemn them? They're so lost. Whew, man, at least, at least I'm not doing that. Where's my response? Man, they are, they are living in sin. That, that burdens my heart. I, I know that, that my heart is no different and my desire to run after the things that are not God's plan for me is strong. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for opportunities to help them and to share the gospel with them because our hearts are the same. And God still rescued me and can do the same for them. There's a famous evangelist or a, uh, an evangelist with some notoriety who has a famous quote that goes something like this. When speaking of preaching the gospel and evangelizing people, he, he said... I'm just a beggar who's showing other beggars where to find bread. We don't want to fall into either camp. We don't want to fall into the camp of, of total apathy towards the sin around us or putting ourselves on the judge's bench when we actually belong at the defendant's table. Verse 2, now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? The only impartial judge is God. His judgment doesn't use a sliding scale. He isn't grading on a curve. If that were true, his holiness, his righteousness, his judgment couldn't be considered perfect and based on the truth. We live in a world that likes to pretend that truth is relative. That you have your truth and I have my truth. And the problem with that idea is that at some point, those different versions of truth are at odds with one another. That's just what happens. And when that happens, whose truth wins? That's where some people might try to argue, well, society determines that. What, what's normative and, and acceptable from a morality standpoint, but... Hey, that breaks down too. 
There are things that we can point to and we can say and objectively say, and people would agree that, hey, that was accepted societally, and yet we know it was not good. We know it was wrong. Nazi Germany, labor and kill camps, genocide. At one time, also, there were entire communities that were built around, like, cannibalism. Like, we can't go, oh, well, societally it was accepted. It's okay. We have to, we have to say that their, mora- their morality was okay. People objectively look at that and go, I, man, I know that's wrong. I know that's not good. It would be absurd to think that. The good news is that God's judgment isn't subject to whims or changing attitudes of culture or human desires. The good news is that God's judgment is perfect, it is unchanging, and it is based on what is true. That's also bad news for us, though, because it means that none of us can live up to God's standard. It means that there are no loopholes for us just because we follow God's rules. There's no loopholes. The other day, our our son came to my wife with a huge handful of gummy bears. And we already let him have some, and that was supposed to be it. But he could reach the package, so he grabbed a handful. And he was technically following the rules. He hadn't eaten anymore. He came and asked a parent if he could have some. But he thought that he had gained the system. Like, since he had already grabbed a handful and removed them from the package, then we would have to say yes, right? He thought he found a loophole in the whole getting more candy than I'm allowed scenario. And and I'm sure maybe you can think of stuff you did as a kid like that. I I can. Um, I remember a time when my mom took me, I was probably five, four, five, six, somewhere around there. My mom took me to buy a pair of shoes at the shoe store. And I really wanted this pair of shoelaces. And I'd taken it to her, and I don't know, they were probably like rainbow colored or something. Who knows? I, they were, I thought they were awesome. And she was like, no, we're not buying those shoelaces. That's ridiculous. And so in my child brain, I was like, well, if I put them in the box, then the cashier will see them and not say anything to my mom and ring them up, and we'll, she'll pay for them, and I'll get home, and I'll have gotten the shoelaces. Win-win. Well, but what actually happened is the, the cashier never opened the box. So in, in effect, I stole the shoelaces. And we get home, and my mom opens the box and, of course, sees the shoelaces that she told me, hey, you can't buy those, and it was a whole thing. And we had to go back and return the shoelaces. I had to apologize. I was mortified. But I thought I'd found this loophole, right? Well, if I sneak stuff in the box, we'll technically pay for it. It will be technically correct. The loophole didn't work for our son and his gummy bears. The loophole didn't work for me and the shoelaces. But we, we don't get a pass when it comes to God's judgment just because we do the right things. I think if we think that our morals or our religion is what saves us and puts us in a position to judge those who don't follow suit or exempts us from experiencing the judgment of God, what we've done effectively is we've placed ourselves at the top of what I'll call morality mountain. It's this mountain that's impossible to climb. We we act as if we climb this mountain on our own and we look down on all of those at the base and, and we call down to them. If you want salvation, you have to climb this mountain like I have. You have to live like I do to be counted as righteous. And and the reality is we were all at the base of that mountain, unable to climb it. We only reached the summit because Jesus carried us up. Tim Keller put it this way. Relying on God's rules for salvation or exemption from God's judgment is as much self-reliance and God rejection as ignoring God's rules. External morality cannot erase internal sin. This is a truth that's taught over and over in Scripture Later in chapter 3 of Romans, Paul quotes the psalmist from Psalm 14 and 53, saying, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We can't escape God's perfect judgment. There aren't any loopholes. So Paul has masterfully laid out the one-two punch here. His audience is not off the hook 
through the first three verses, and when we get to verse 4, he does not let off the gas. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Paul says, hey, if you're interpreting God's lack of judgment, his lack of punishment, as his apathy or his approval, then you have misunderstood the purpose of his kindness. When we speak of God's kindness here, it's a word that has its roots in God's character, in his goodness. But in, in this sense, it's in relation to his actions toward us, not just the static nature of his being. So we end up with the word kindness. And we see God's goodness and kindness in so many ways, ways that are easy to take for granted. When God created everything and when he saw all that he had made, he called it very good. And that is still true. The fact that it is good is why Paul pointed to creation as evidence for God in chapter 1. And we take the goodness of God's creation for granted so much. From the windows in our sitting room, you can always catch a really nice glimpse of the sunset. If you look at the right time, and I've noticed recently that Erin has started setting an alarm on her phone every day uh, for what time the sun will set so that she's reminded to look out the window. And when she does, she usually calls our attention to it, like mine and the boys, and will say something like, look how beautiful God's creation is. God didn't have to create this world with the beauty that he did, but in his kindness, he surrounded us with very good things. And his kindness extends beyond that for uh, in his common grace to all mankind. In Matthew 5.45, Jesus said, Speaking of God the Father, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's common grace that God extends to all mankind, and it's easy to take that for granted. Ultimately, God's kindness towards us, this is a hard one to wrap our minds around, but God's kindness towards us is evident in the fact that he doesn't kill us where we stand in our sin. You might say, man, I don't know, Trevor, that doesn't sound very kind. It doesn't sound very good that he wouldn't kill us. That is kindness. But think for a moment about the depth of your own sin. Consider just how holy God is. God's holiness is perfect, meaning there's nothing impure, sinful, or unclean about him. And in, in the Old Testament, when sinful people were exposed to the pure and perfect manifest glory of God, it killed them. Think about how big the chasm was that the cross became a bridge for between our sin and God's holiness. It is kindness. It is his kindness. It is his patience. It is his long suffering. It is his forbearance that sinners are not dead where they stand. And this passage teaches us the reason for that. The reason is that his kindness would lead us to repentance. Not that his lack of punishment or judgment right now in this moment would give us some kind of indication of his approval or that everything is okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Or that what I do doesn't matter, but that his kindness would lead us toward repentance. In other words, are we taking God's grace for granted? Do not take for granted God's kindness and his patience. God stays his hand of judgment in his patience and in his kindness in order that people might come face to face with the depths of their sin in light of a holy God so that they would truly repent and turn to him. Misunderstanding God's kindness in this area and resisting repentance puts us on very dangerous ground. The moral person might conclude that the fact that God has not judged them yet means that he approves of their moral behavior and that this somehow equates to right standing, but that couldn't be farther from the, tr the truth. God's kindness, his patience does not equate to approval, to acceptance, or forgiveness. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to repent, to turn, to follow God. So as we near the end of this passage, we come to what's one of the scarier verses in the Bible. Verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, 
You are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And so when we read something like that with verse 4, it, it can sound pretty scary if we don't have a proper understanding. When I was younger, I had a shaky grasp of my assurance before God. When I sinned, which was often I felt like I had to recommit or maybe even reestablish my salvation. I, I grew up uh, in, a, in a church environment that often stressed moral standing and behavioral management. And, and I wasn't really discipled in a way that I understood how my justification worked once and for all. And that my right standing with God was not in question when I sinned, but rather regular rhythms of repentance and turning from sin to follow Christ's commandments is a normal part of the Christian life and of progressive sanctification. So what these verses here at the end are not saying is that my security in Christ is only as strong as my most recent repentance. It was that kind of teaching coupled with tying forgiveness up and monetary penance that led to the Protestant Reformation. My security in Christ is not only as strong as my most recent repentance. One commentator says it like this, Paul is not condemning shaky discipleship, but complacent and persistent hypocrisy. The pseudo-discipleship that thinks the need for repentance ended with my conversion. What Paul wants to expose is not the life that someone that sometimes falls into sin and therefore needs repentance as an ongoing discipline, but rather the hard and impenitent heart that systematically will not repent. Paul speaks not to the penitent heart that lacks assurance, but to the impenitent heart that has a false assurance. So this verse, I mean, we have to wrestle with it. It should make us pause, to make us examine ourselves. If I die in my sin and unrepentance, then when I'm supposed to give an account for my sins, I'll have nothing to justify me. My own inconsistent values will condemn me, and the wrath that I have stored up will be given to me as judgment and punishment for all eternity. That's a very, very grave thing. I need to take stock of my heart, of what drives me, of what I believe to be true about my standing before God and why that is. And so as we're nearing the end this morning, I, I imagine the question that lingers in the air is, am I the you that Paul is addressing here? Is that me? And, and here's a few ways we can find out if we ask ourselves these questions. Do I feel that I'm a hopeless sinner whom God would have a perfect right to cast off this minute because of the state of my life and my heart? When I consider how those outside my church live, do I shake my head and judge in my heart or do I think my heart is by nature just like theirs? It just shows itself differently. Do I deep down think there is no account for my wrongdoing and that I can stand before my own judgment at the end of my life? Have I accepted that my own values condemn me and that I will need to be given a right standing that I could never achieve myself? Depending on how we answer those questions should give us an indication of the status of our heart and of the necessity and of the depth of our repentance. Because one day, in, in the language of Paul, both, both Jew, the Jew and the Greek the pagan and the pious, the, the chiefs and the raiders fan. Everyone will stand before God and give an account of their lives. And for the irreligious Romans, one tells us that I didn't know righteousness isn't going to cut it. And Romans 2 tells us that the religious or the moral person is also without excuse. I didn't know righteousness won't cut it, just like I'm not as bad as them, righteousness. Won't cut it. Everyone is without excuse. The only thing that can justify, the only thing, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Neither person can live up to the perfect moral standard of God that it would take to maintain self-righteousness. The perfect life that Christ lived, that's not just some tired trope that we recite when we mention the gospel. It was necessary. His perfect life was necessary for us to be able to receive the righteousness that he, that he gives us. Only a life lived in perfect obedience to God could be offered in exchange for all the sin and wickedness of your heart and my heart. And you and I could not do that. 
The bad news is that we all sit under the judgment of God. Preacher's kids and prodigal sons alike. None of us can escape it. But the very, very good news is that when we get to that judgment day and we have to give an account for our lives and all the sins of our lives are tallied up, if we have truly repented, if we have seen our sin for what it is, recognizing that because of the depths of our own depravity that we have no right to sit in judgment over anyone, if we have done that and we've placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then God will take that tally and with an inkwell filled with the blood of Jesus Christ, he will write over the top of it paid in full. The perfect sacrifice of Jesus has removed the condemnation for all of this sin. Often we have uh, in texts that we preach, um, there's really an easy on-ramp to applications. Like the, the way that the text is preached and the way that it's talked about is like, man, that's really easy to take and go, yeah, this is how I apply it to my life. Sermon on the Mount's a good illustration of that. Jesus is literally telling people how to live, right? Uh, other texts, harder texts, um, we can come to this place and go, so what, what is the application here? How do I, how do I apply that? Uh, and, and I think first, the, the, for, for the believer here, uh, the main thing to do is to wrestle with this text. To wrestle with this text. Ask those questions of yourself. Have a conversation with people after the service. Talk about it in your gospel community, in your discipleship group. Uh, downstairs, coffee and donuts. Hey, you want to talk about this really hard passage we just heard preached? We need to wrestle with texts like this. It's important for our faith, for our understanding of who God is, of who we are. So wrestling with that. And then I think the other application, maybe you're somebody who just... You're here, and you've kind of been around the community of faith, but you haven't quite rounded that corner of, like, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, of totally, like, recognizing your own sin and God's holiness and the gap there and the, the reality of my need for a Savior. And so the application for you today is believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus Christ came and he, he died for you and he rose again and is alive today. Verse 5 in this text, the storing up of wrath, that is, that is the condemnation, that is for the person who has not done that, who has not seen that, who has not had their heart changed and put their faith in Jesus. So wrestle with this text this morning. Believe the gospel today. Would you pray with me? God, again, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for... Um, all aspects of your word. More difficult texts to understand um, or to apply. God, we, we ask that you would give us insight that as we, um, these things linger in our minds and in our hearts, God, that you and, and your Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth, like your word says. God, where we have not given over um, these types of judgments and, and this type of moral living a, a, as a means for earning salvation or, or a way that we think we're justified before you, God, even in maybe small, subtle ways, God, would, we, would you help us to see those things and those realities and, and to give those over to you, God, that we would, um, we would move on from that type of thinking, understanding our role as a people who have been saved and have been justified to then go to the world that is, that is participating in all kinds of evil and sin like we saw in, in, in the first chapter, God, that we would, we would see that and, and like Jesus standing and looking over Jerusalem, like our hearts would break. Our hearts would break. We would not stand in judgment and condemnation, but we would stand in love and compassion for people who have not yet turned their lives over to you. God, would you drive us towards that? Would you lead us into repentance where it's needed? God, I pray for people, if there's anyone here who has not come to that conclusion that, man, I, I, cannot, I cannot do this on my own. I stand in judgment apart from the work of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that today they could give their heart to you, that they could 
believe in faith what you have said is true about what Christ did, who he is, and the saving faith that it requires for them to do that. God, would you grant them that? God, would you be with all of us as we continue to wrestle with this in our groups? Give us your grace and your kindness just a little while longer. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.